Now, what about the insulin pump? Well, there's some clear advantages to using the insulin pump. Um, for example, carrying insulin and supplies, including syringes, is unnecessary with the insulin pump. Bolises can be given at any time during the day, so if the patient has a snack that she normally would not have and is um, pretty uh, carbohydrate rich, she's able to give an extra bolus. Um, the pump can be also be placed on suspend if the patient is experiencing some hypoglycemia, is planning on exercising, or has a delayed meal. And um, bolus and rates can be modified into several programs if the patient, for example, has a night shift. Um, this is particularly important for uh, patients who are nurses and work different types of shifts. We can set their pumps into several programs. The disadvantages of a pump are that the patient has to be pretty tech savvy. They need to know how to program the pump, and they really need to be, have an understanding about the interaction of exercise, diet, and stress on their insulin doses. Um, there can be problems with bad sites. Uh, we've all experienced this in our patients with type 1 diabetes, as well as leaching of some of the um, insulin into the pump, and then, of course, um, not so much fashion considerations, although that's what I have here, but it's more um, um, patients really don't want to advertise the fact that they have um, type 1 diabetes, but unfortunately the pump can be seen underneath cloth clothing, particularly for women. So how do I calculate the insulin pump doses? I must um, let you know that generally most of my patients present uh, either in the first trimester or pre-pregnancy with a pump already. But there are a fair amount of patients that I start on an insulin pump. And if I do, generally, I calculate the total daily insulin dose as um, I do for our type 2 diabetes patients based on their weight as well as the gestational age in pregnancy at which I'm starting the insulin pump. As an example, I have calculated a pre-pump total daily dose for a patient of about 50 units. I then decrease that dose by about 10 to 25 percent, which gives us about 37 units in this example. To calculate the basal rate, I then divide that insulin dose by 50 percent and further divide that 50 percent by 24 hours. In our example, we calculated 37 units of insulin as a starting dose. Divide that by 15 percent, which gives you 18.5 units and divide that by 24 hours, which gives you about 0.8 units per hour as a basal rate. But I make adjustments um, to take into account the DOM phenomenon that again occurs about 2 to 4 a.m., so I actually decrease the units um, per hour of insulin at, at around midnight. So here's a typical example of an uh, insulin pump infusion. This is, again, published in uh, the textbook 3C and Resnick by my mentor, Dr. Moore. And as you can see, at 12 uh, midnight, I usually decrease the basal rate to about, in this example, 0.6 units of insulin per hour. Again, we lower it for sleep and, again, uh, with the understanding about the um, hypoglycemia that occurs at 2 to 4 a.m. Then we increase it to counteract that um, insulin resistance that occurs in the morning. And it typically is the highest um, segment at 5 a.m. And then as we progress during the day, we lower the basal rate of insulin such that at bedtime, it's probably the lowest insulin rate. And then, of course, we have the insulin bolus, boluses that are given with um, pre-breakfast, pre-lunch, and pre-dinner. Generally speaking, I have my patients um, calculate units of insulin to be given uh, per carbohydrate. Generally, in the first trimester, I instruct them to start one unit of insulin every 10 to 15 carbs for breakfast, lunch, and dinner, and then adjust it as we go forward. In the second trimester, I lower that ratio to about 6 to 8 for breakfast, 8 to 10 for lunch, and about 8 to 10 for dinner. It, remember that because of the insulin resistance, in the morning, you tend to increase your insulin requirements. Um, so breakfast time is uh, usually the largest bolus of insulin given. And again, we use a lower carb ratio in the third trimester. So what are the differences between carb counting and fixed dosing? I tend to lean more towards carb counting because most of my patients are fairly savvy. They can estimate their carb ratios nowadays fairly easily, um, particularly with our smart 
smartphones and our smart tablets, we're able to actually download programs that have pretty good estimates of carbohydrates. Um, and, and some of them actually have scanning potential. So you can scan you know, a piece of bread, for example, and know how much carbohydrates are in there um, using the barcodes on the packages. Um, and also they have meals for different types of restaurants, so it's not so much of a, as a problem as it was in the past. However, there, it's still you need to kind of guesstimate when you go out to eat how many carbohydrates you're ingesting. And it doesn't allow for flexibility in the diet. However, there are a subset of patients where I use fixed dosing, um, where there is no math involved. And obviously, those are our patients that aren't literate or can't do sim um, simple math um, calculations. Usually, um, in these kinds of patients, I also put them on a very regimented diet, um, where they have just one to two options for each of the meals. Um, so it's a very standardized diet. And I've had success with these types of complicated patients with fixed dosing of insulin. Now we're going to move on to discuss um, oral hypoglycemics. So as you know, there's different mechanisms for um, hyperglycemia. Um, there may be lower insulin secretion um, that can occur. There can also be lower uh, muscle uptake of glucose and increase in hepatic glucose production. And medications are used um, in type 2 diabetes to target all these different mechanisms of hyperglycemia. The ones we'll be focusing on are the secretagogues such as um, sulfonylureos or glyburide, and the biguanides such as um, metformin. The main concern with using hyper, the oral hypoglycemics in pregnancy was the concern for congenital anomalies. There were actually some studies initially performed with sulfonylureos, the first generation of sulfonylureos in the 70s and 80s, that really raised a concern for congenital anomalies. However, these older studies did not um, control for hemoglobin A1c in these patients. And as you all know, the higher the hemoglobin A1C, the higher the risk of congenital anomaly. And so really these studies were poorly designed but still raised concerns about the risk of um, congenital anomalies, particularly with sulfonylurea. So that's why we do not use sulfonylureas in the first trimester. There was also a concern for whether or not these medications can cross the placenta and lead to um, hyperinsulinemia in the fetal pancreas by stimulating the fetal pancreas directly and therefore leading to macro, macrosomia and hypoglycemia, which are two complications that we're trying to avoid. And so sulfonylureas, as you know, are um, insulin secretagogues. So what they do is they bind to receptors in the beta cells in the pancreas, which then leads to a cascade, um, which leads to an increase in calcium channel release and increase in cytoplasmic calcium and therefore insulin release by the pancreas. Early studies in vitro using single cotyledon placental models showed that, that there was virtually no transfer of glyburide across the placenta using doses of 100 times that um, normally used. And so that, that was an important finding and that there was also no appreciable metabolism of the drug in the placenta. This is important because the placenta actually metabolizes some of these medications. The results of these studies then led to our desire um, to use it in pregnancy as it was demonstrated that it did not cross the placenta, then maybe it was a good candidate for, it, for use in pregnancy. The first um, randomized control trial and the only randomized control trial of glyburide was performed in 2000 by Dr. Langer in Texas, where he randomized women with um, gestational diabetes to glyburide and insulin. The way he dosed glyburide was an initial dose of 2.5 milligrams to be divided in BID doses um, in the morning and at bedtime. And then he increased the dose of glyburide by 2.5 milligram increments. What they found was that there was no statistical differences in glycemic control between the uh, glyburide treated and insulin treated patients. There were also no differences in neonatal outcomes and no difference in C peptide among the infants born to um, glyburide versus insulin. However, um, people that were skeptical of the use of glyburide in pregnancy noted that even though there was no statistical differences in the rates of neonatal outcomes, they do point out that there was a higher rate of macrosomia. As you can see, the rate of 
the semantic library group was 7% versus 4% in the insulin group. And the rate of hypoglycemia, again, although not statistically different, was higher in the library treated group. They did also find that there was no glyburide in the cord serum. However, the authors did not really tell us how they measured the glyburide in the cord serum of these infants. In other words, the assay they utilized was not really clearly um, outlined. So then in 2008, seven years after the initial publication of the randomized control trial, Dr. Hebert and her group actually looked at the pharmacokinetics of glyburide in pregnancy. And what she did is she compared the concentrations of glyburide in patients with type 2 diabetes who are not pregnant and in patients with gestational diabetes. And what she found was actually that glyburide does cross the placenta with a concentration of 0 0.7. And these were glyburide metabolites that were crossing the placenta. And if you look at the glyburide concentration in patients with type 2 here, type 2 diabetes who are not pregnant here in the um, solid line versus um, patients with gestational diabetes here in the dotted line, you see that the concentration of um, glyburide was actually um, higher in patients with type 2 diabetes. So it appears that in pregnancy, um, the glyburide peaks at about 2.75 hours. The half-life is anywhere from two to three and a half hours. And the usefulness, um, if you will, of uh, glyburide is anywhere from six to 10 hours. So at UCSD, we actually um, use glyburide in a targeted manner to treat um, postprandial as well as fasting glucose values. So generally speaking, we're, we initiate patients on glyburide based on the patient's weight. If they weigh less than 200, I usually start glyburide 1.25 milligram. If they weigh greater than 200, then I start glyburide at 2.5 milligrams. As I stated above, I use it in a targeted manner to target their postprandial values. So generally speaking, I instruct the patient to take the glyburide about an hour before her meals. And again, we start anywhere from 1.25 to 2.5 milligrams. And then I increase it by 1.25 to 2.5 milligram increments to a max of 10 milligrams per segment per meal. I also um, instruct the patient to take glyburide after 10 p.m. to target her fasting glucose values. Now, this is different from the CDAP website. They actually recommend um, the Langer uh, method of dosing glyburide, which is BID. Now, with glyburide, it's important to make changes every four days. You need to allow for a steady state of the medication. And generally speaking, as we uh, reviewed earlier, if I reach a maximum dose of 10 milligrams per segment or a total dose of 15 to 20 milligrams per day, then I start adding insulin to control their blood glucose if needed. Um, again, we add insulin more than 30% of the blood glucose are above the target. <clears throat> 